fantastic NixCon. So uh, today I'm going to talk about debugging closure sizes graphically. Um, so for context, um, I am a computer engineering student at UBC in Vancouver, BC. I'm from Canada. And um, I'm currently on an internship working for Mercury, which is a company offering banking for the unique needs of startups. Note the disclaimer. Um, we use Haskell, Postgres, TypeScript, Nix, and many other things. Um, and I work on internal tools for risk management. So um, disclaimer, views represented in this talk are not the views of Mercury, they're my own. Uh, so what is closure size? So closure size is basically the dependency, the size of your thing and then everything it depends on. And that is transitive. So everything that it depends on and everything that that depends on and so on. Um, and so the major cause of closure size generally is accidental dependencies, although it can also happen that you're just putting too much stuff in for no reason. Like, say you're leaving build products in. Um, so how do you create a dependency? So this is, uh, this is Sally the suspiciously sentient spaghetti. Um, so if you, if you depend on, on, on some spaghetti, like, consider the spaghetti to be a stand-in for your choice of compiler, you know, build system, language runtime, anything that you don't mean to depend on, but which is very large. And so you include that in your build inputs because you need to use it to build your product, but then you don't necessarily use it at runtime. And so in order to cause a runtime dependency, you need to go put the path of your pile of spaghetti into, the, into somewhere in the out directory. So literally the way that dependencies work in Nix for runtime dependencies is that it will literally grep the output directory for the hash part of any store paths of your inputs. That's, it's crude, but it works. And so this, this is the resulting dependency graph. You, your, your app now has a runtime dependency on a pile of spaghetti. Um, so the problem with these large closures is that every time that you use your app, you need to ship around the spaghetti. And this is obviously problematic because you're just shipping around useless bytes. And um, this is somewhat of a unique Nix issue that this happens, but um, the alternative is being too, uh, too careless with your runtime dependency design. So say, say you have your, your little container ship with your little container and um, you're, you're shipping around this big pile of spaghetti in addition to your app. And so this, this is just frustrating because it slows down pulls, it slows down deploys, and it's just generally sad. Um, it's partially mitigable by um, if you use the layered um, build type for Docker containers, the, it will put each Nix store path into a layer or like collate them together to some degree. And that will mean that often it won't actually have to fetch the bowl of spaghetti if it hasn't changed. But nevertheless, it's ideal to just not send balls of spaghetti around. This also affects NixOS deploys, although again, if the path is already on the target, it doesn't matter as much. Uh, so in order to find what your stuff depends on, there's a command called Nix path info. Um, there's also a previous version of this command. It's one of the Nix store commands. I think it's Nix store query. Um, and so what this path or what this command will tell you is the size of your thing, which is this number on the left and then it will show you the uh, closure size of that path. But notably, even with hello, like you don't really see where the dependencies are here. And so like these dependencies are fundamentally a graph. And so like what if we look at them like a graph? Um, there is actually functionality inside Nix store um, that can actually generate graph viz for these things, but it, it's not very good and it doesn't really give you a lot of details. So like, what if, what if I just go like write a JQ script that goes and generates graphs out of these things and like see what happens? So I did that and it's pretty cool. Like this is much better. You can see the actual closure sizes um, next to the thing and it's showed in, in, in nice human readable output and it's right next to the thing. But the problem is that this is graph is. And the problem with graph is, is that it kind of doesn't do very good at big graphs. Um, this, I, I, I seem to keep running into this. So 
it turns out that <laughs> that this doesn't work very well when you put a NixOS closure into it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you would have the same consequence if you tried to do this with the like Nix store commands because fundamentally the problem is the grass too big. So like, okay. I mean, may, can we can we have our cake and eat it too? So it turns out that you know these large graphs are a problem in many domains, and I had this problem at work, so I built a prototype of a graph viewer. And so, you know, what if I just go put the NixOS closure into it? You can, by the way, get the graph viewer there. It uses Sigma JS, which is a, a library for rendering graphs in JavaScript, and it is really awesome. It can deal with very large graphs and it renders on the GPU and it's just great. So um, yeah, highly recommend that. So yeah, let's just you know go and build a, a minified version of my main NixOS config and you know copy paste it and see what happens. And you know it turns out that it doesn't actually fall over. So like this is the NixOS closure. Like yeah, it's ugly, but it you know the graph viewer is perfectly capable of dealing with it. And like, it takes a hot minute to render, but could be worse. Um, and incidentally, you know, if you, if you go look at this and you see, hmm, these look like a bunch of package packages. What are those doing there? Uh, it turns out I have a package that I wrote called hsutils that has a bunch of utilities I wrote in Haskell. And the closure size is 3.3 gigabytes, which seems bad given so Nix has this command that's really cool. It's called y depends. And um, if you pass dash dash precise, it will actually tell you exactly like which files are causing these runtime dependencies by going and scrapping it. <laughs> and so yeah, if you use Nix y depends dash dash precise dash all, um, you can just get a list of these things. And uh, if we look at this, we see that this libhsutils.so has some kind of colon separated list of, of a bunch of these store paths. I don't particularly know why it does this. Um, there's a bug related to path modules that is filed against Nick packages, but you know, I am not sure if that's the cause. Maybe it's, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But anyway, I actually ran into this like when I was initially learning Nix two years ago. And like, I just like have a patch where I more or less like did the solution to this. So why did Haskell put that there? So that it filed as well because um, it's been there for a while. Um, so enough of Haskell. Time for something practical. This message not sponsored by work. <laughs> um, so I was packaging this budgeting program to run it on fly.io because, you know, fly.io is pretty cool. And I wanted to figure out how to build a Docker image for it with Nix. So I did that. And then 219 megabytes. I don't want to ship that. <laughs> Like, it's just some JavaScript. How bad could it be? Well, let's get out the big guns. So we go and copy this, this closure graph. Um, and if we go look at the result here, we can see, hmm, there's the program, which has 568 megabytes of closure. And then you see this actual sync modules thing that seems to be exactly the same size or approximately so, which seems suspicious. And then what, well, okay, let's, what else is in here? Python, why is there Python? This is supposed to be JavaScript. Where did it come from? Who knows? So if we go and look at like, okay, well, what, what's attached to this? We go look at Node.js. Node.js depends on Python. Why does Node.js depend on Python? <laughs> like, what went wrong here? <laughs> so, yeah, like we have this, this identical thing to our code. We have Python. 
how did this happen? So, well, Python. So what happened here is that Node.js has this rather obsolescent and extremely poorly named build system called Generate Your Product or Project um, in order to create C++ extensions, which happens to be used by Bcrypt and Better SQLite and some other stuff that is used by the um, by actual budget. And this unfortunately named build system was inherited from Chromium, which no longer uses it. So it was one of the blockers on Python 2 and is otherwise not good. So like generate into my projects, I don't want that. So it turns out that Nix Packages actually has a version of Node.js that does not depend on Python, which is pretty good. Um, it's called Node.js Slim. But we do actually use this build system to build these C++ extensions. So the solution here is that we probably want to replace the, like we want to build it, and then we want to replace it with the Slim version of Node. And so, well, and the other we use actual server thing depend on actual sync modules. And Nix will tell us that it is because there's this thing, which is the stim link, to actual sync modules. Okay, but like, what's the stim link doing there? Like, what's in this stim link? And, you know, if we go and look at what's in the stim link, then ESLint prettier TSC, TS server, does not sound like runtime dependencies that I care about, to be quite honest. So clearly it's doing something unhelpful at the very least. So like, I don't know why it did this. It seems like every time that we see closure size problems, it's just because of absurdity. Like, you know, why? It's always something completely pointless. And so in order to actually fix it, our goals here are one, getting rid of Python. So using Node.js Slim and fixing the app being included twice. So we have a demo. All right, so uh, we're just showing the initial one. So the initial closure size, and this is the number to beat, is 568 megabytes. And we can see in there that, you know, it depends on SQLite and that's reasonable. So, okay, the first thing that we're gonna do here, so this is, this is the, um, the derivation for um, building this actual server thing. And it imports horrors beyond comprehension.nix, which is the part where it actually does the building of the native modules. And that is uninteresting to the closure size stuff. And um, we also use don't strip because it is a waste of time to strip JavaScript binaries. And uh, there's, there's some other things, but it's largely not super interesting. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna add a dist phase. So this is run late in the builder and it's useful for doing fix ups, which is what we're doing. So we're gonna add that. And then in that dist phase, first we're just gonna delete the sim link that we have accidentally added that we don't want. Um, and then it turns out that not only was that sim link pointless, it was also wrong. So, um, what? Video playback aborted to a, to a network error? How is that possible? It's running on localhost. <laughs> like, why would this happen? I mean, I, I know that the, uh, the, the Python dash M HTTP dot server is not the best thing, but um, anyway, we're just gonna go and fast forward past that. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's fixed. Yeah, so not only was it pointless, but it was also wrong. Um, it turns out that like the sim link was not even going to the place that it should have been going in order for the app to actually work. So that's kind of not ideal. Um, okay, so the next thing that we're gonna do is we're going to don't patch shebang. So the way that Nix deals with shebangs of various shell scripts or scripts in any other language is that they um, use shebang user bin ends and then the name of the thing. And so this works, but it doesn't work when you want your things to be actually hermetic and not look at the path. And so in order to make these scripts work, 
you go and patch these shebangs so that they point to the exact path of the thing that they're trying to call. And so that's one of the stages in the builder that's often done. Um, but in this case, we don't want this because um, we largely don't care about the script. So we just want to like turn that off. There's only one script that we actually care about. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to add remove references to to native build inputs. So remove references to turns the hash part of a Nix store path into A's. Like it, it makes, it just breaks them, um, which is great when they're pointless. Uh, and then the last thing we're going to do is we're going to stick disallowed references in. So this is going to say, my derivation cannot depend on Node.js16.x, and if it does, you should throw an error. And uh, disallowed references is actually a somewhat questionably documented um, property that Nix itself looks at. So uh, then, then we're going to actually try and build this and, and see that it's going to go awry because the uh, it does actually depend on Node.js16.x because of various things in dependencies. Um, and so the like various dependencies have their little maintainer scripts things that they've put in there, and then Nix has dutifully like gone and patched shebang them, even though that we have don't patch shebangs true because it patched the shebangs in the like when it was doing npm install. <laughs> and so these shebangs are like patched anyway, even though we didn't do this. It's it's really like I, I, I've had, I had so much fun while initially figuring this all out. Um, but regardless, uh, then we're going to go and delete these shebangs. So uh, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to manually um, patch the one of the one binary that we actually care about. Um, we're going to use sed, which is basically the same thing as uh, ED, which is basically the same thing as X, which is basically the same thing as VI, which is basically the same thing as VIM, um, <laughs> to change the first line of the file to um, to a direct uh, path to Node.js slim 16.x slash bin slash node. And then we're going to go look for all the executables in our dependencies and go and delete their, uh, their shebangs. So and, and any other references, because there are some other references. And then we're going to go and copy this thing. Um, so, so now we've made a closure graph. And so we're going to open another one of the graph viewers and see where we've got to. And now we see, one, we don't, we don't see ourselves there for no reason. And two, we're down to 324 megabytes from 560. So that was achieved by, uh, to reiterate, deleting um, references to the full fat node that includes Python for no reason, and also um, not including our own source code for fun twice. And so here you can see actually there's another one that's like, what, what's this doing here? And, and so for some reason, OpenSSL depends on Perl, if, if you haven't seen this before. Um, and the reason that OpenSSL depends on Perl is because there is a currently open Nix packages bug that um, is essentially stating that one of the scripts includes with, included with OpenSSL uses a Perl shebang, except no one uses the script. So should it be deleted? I don't know. Um, but, but that one's a 88 megabytes that you could just, I mean, it's not 88 megabytes by itself, because like um, the closure size there includes everything that it depends on, like glibc. So, it's probably like 40 megabytes, but still, that's, that can totally be knocked right out. And so that's kind of the end of the demo. Um, the other thing that I want to show is that um, the end result is that our Docker image is now 144 megabytes, which is down from 200 and some, um, which is significantly better. And there's just less stuff in it. And so, um, and also one might wonder, like, Jade, how did you copy things from an SSH session? Um, and the answer is that I wrote a daemon for that. So in summary, um, accidental dependencies are one of the main causes of closure size bloat. Um, like, 
it's true that putting too much stuff in the output can cause closure site bloat, but usually people care about that because they like it happens to people who aren't using Dix. And you know, shipping suspiciously sentient spaghetti splits time and bandwidth, which is not ideal. And the solution to closure size issues is most of the time finding the references with Nix, um, well, finding out that you have a problem with Nix path info and potentially the uh, tooling to go and look at the closures and looking for things that shouldn't be there. And then once you've found the things that shouldn't be there, you can use Nix Y depends to ask Nix why is like why is this here, and it will probably tell you that it's some reference in some kind of script or potentially that your compiler is for some reason emitting paths for no reason. And then once you've figured out why it's happening, you can go and take action on that by um, getting rid of the dependencies that are causing you problems or by um, replacing the path with entirely A's to break the path so that it just doesn't work if it tries to access the thing that it shouldn't. Um, and another message is that Mercury is hiring um, in a lot of areas. If you are interested in um, applying, the uh, link is mercury.com slash jobs. Um, they will train you on how to. And so that's all I have. Um, you can get the tools that I've used here. Um, the Nix closure graph is in my monorepo, which is um, somewhat mysteriously called dot files. I don't know why. And <laughs> you can get the graph viewer at um, mercurytechnologies.github.io slash looking glass viewer. It's kind of a very nice graph viewer. Um, it takes in JSON um, of a very simple format to the point that you can literally write database queries that will, um, in, in one Postgres query, it will spit out the entire graph JSON and you can stick it right into the graph viewer and it makes it very convenient to visualize things. At die, and you can also email me. Um, so does anyone have any questions? We have time for two questions, so. Do you think that there are any ways that we could do any of that automatically or like do something more sophisticated than grep for dependencies or is it just will necessarily make mistakes and depend on Python? Yeah, so the way that every other system deals with this is that um, it actually um, does it quite badly. So in most package managers um, and most Linux distributions, if you're writing a package and it has a it just won't work at runtime. Nix prevents this, which is great. But um, in terms of like whether something better than grepping it is um, is is like an improvement. Um, as far as I know, Nix itself has done fairly well with just like grepping these things. Like I don't think it even looks for UTF-16. And it's just works, which is quite surprising that something so crude would work. Um, in terms of something to, like, if you mean to find, like, the cause of these unintended dependencies um, that's better than grepping it, I don't really think so because often they go and lurk in corners of files that may or may not even be parsed by tools. And so, like, if it's not parsed by the tool, but Nick sees it, that's kind of not ideal. So yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure like what would help as far as tooling that would make it easier to stop this happening by accident. Um, I think that maybe people should uh, use allowed references more. So there's a, a, a counterpart to um, disallowed references, which is allowed references, and you can declare the entire set of the expected runtime dependencies of your thing. And then if you go and include that, then it will make it a build error if someone screws it up.
um, since you were using this allow references for what you were doing there, wouldn't this allow requisites be more appropriate to disallow it in the like whole dependency closure? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Instead of using disallowed references, wouldn't you maybe want to use disallowed requisites for these kind of things and allowed requisites as well? Um, I actually don't remember if allowed references works transitively. Like, if, if say, you depend on Python, does that let you depend on glibc? I don't remember, um, but you'd have to check the Nix docs on that. That might be one reason. Um, but generally, like, I feel like closure size is not necessarily something that people think of when they're building something. It's more so when it goes wrong. And maybe this should change, um, but like in the current sort of thought pattern of dealing with that, it, um, it's sometimes better to um, use uh, disallowed references instead, just because it's easier. Thank you very much.